talking about human beings and not numbers. Um, okay, so the phenomenon must be identified. Number three, bracket research bias and interpretation. All right, so we talked about bracketing before, um, sort of generally. I'm going to talk just briefly about the importance of bracketing because this happens quite a bit in, in research. Uh, and here's why it's important. Insofar as a researcher recognizes and addresses his or her bias, his or her um, preconceptions, what the researcher does is the researcher opens a window for the reader to see into sort of the interpretive, interpretive process that the researcher is going through. What in the world does that mean? I don't read, <laughs> you know, a quick, quick tangent. This is, I'll tie this in. Um, I, I love those videos. It's, it's like, just Google it. Uh, or not even Google it. Put it in YouTube. Put in speed reading. I mean, put in like speed reading infomercial, right? And speed reading infomercials are great, right? Because the guy will go, hi, I've just taken a speed reading course. And I'm going to, you know, pay me $19.95 and I'll show you how to speed read. Watch how fast I can read. Oh, man, that book was great. <laughs> it's ridiculous, right? It's absolutely absurd. Um, it's, it's a very deliberative process, right? The process of, especially philosophical reading, not narrative reading, is, 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 very, is very deliberative. And so far as I'm being deliberative in the process, as you advance through your education, people don't just read your work for what you're saying. People read your work to see how you think. How does Jason, how does his mind process the world? Why is it that, for example, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, um, Five Stages of Death, everybody wants to knock it now. Oh, you know, there's, it's not exhaustive, and you know, why would she just say five stages and there's more stages and less stages? Uh, you know, other people want to do different stage accounts and. None of that would have been possible without her account. I'm not interested in their accounts. I'm interested in Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's account. What is it about her mind that gets her to think like that? Right? You can read text in that matter. Yeah, sure, Jason wrote a book on genocidal intent, but why in the hell would Jason write a book about genocidal intent? Why? How did he interpret it the way that he interpreted it? Right? So as a researcher, and this isn't just for phenomenological research, as a qualitative researcher in the social sciences, period, the best way that you give your reader a little access into how you think, how you process, is by bracketing, right? You, they have to, you and they have to be very deliberate in this process because you, and you have to expose yourself a bit by saying, hey, here's who I am a little bit, and here's, because I am this person, here's how it's affecting my interpretation of research. I'm a young, poor kid um, from a single family, eldest of six, grew up in the projects, seen the homeboys get buried, lived that, you know, I've seen it, I've seen it, you know, I don't just talk it, I lived it. Um, so I know what it's like to be in an impoverished community. I know what it's like to have friends who die from gang affiliation and drugs and stupid foolishness, right? Um, that is going to give me a particular skew on things. It's going to skew my interpretation, right, for better or for worse. If I divulge that to the reader, then the reader now has um, a method in which the reader can attempt to deliberate like I do, right? Um, and if it's the case that they want to use that in their own research, that's why we do this, right? So there's a level at which, and this is not, this is not that part I apologize for because that was not introductory at all, but there's a level at which when you're doing qualitative research, it's not even just about the subject or the phenomena itself, but there is a sense in which, especially when we're talking about bracketing, you allow the reader through this, through this methodical process of disclosure, um, self-disclosure in a sense, or research bias, um, into the mechanisms of how your mind operates. How is it that he read the same thing that I read and interpreted it like this? Oh, part of his interpretation of this must be because he bracketed it and told me that he experienced this. I haven't experienced this, but I can use my creative imagination and think, man, were, to, were I to have experienced that, I too could have come at that conclusion. And now, a researcher to make his or her research a little fuller can imagine what that experience might be like and, and write on it. One of the best, um, a, a good friend of mine, uh, Shay, who's a super rock star, um, uh, she, did, she held a, a conference called a SWAP conference at uh, Florida State University, first of its kind, and, um, 
and I remember I saw a graduate student from, I don't remember where, I want to say it was like Tulane University as a white girl, white woman, and her paper was, can a white, can a white woman be a black feminist? That's exactly what I'm talking about, right? That's exactly it. It's, it's like, I'm bracket, she obviously has to bracket that, right? You can't write a phenomenological account of can a white woman be a black feminist without acknowledging that the whole research is, in a sense, based on bracketing. It's a very unique type of research, but that's an excellent question. And the answer is yes, right? Can a white feminist be, with, a, with an asterisk, <laughs> um, can a white woman be a black feminist? Sure. Um, the research begins with, hey, guess what? I'm a white woman. And guess what? I want to know if I can be a black feminist. And hey, guess what? After dot, 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 I realize that I can with an asterisk. So that type of thing. Bracketing is important. Um, it is essential. It's not just a mode of sort of self-disclosure and bias, but like the example of can a white woman be a black feminist, it can be the mode of phenomenological interpretation. You can have a phenomenological interpretation that is solely devoted to analyzing the bracketing of an individual, the subject, whatever. It's a more heady type, but it, it has been done and it can be done. Number four. Um, we want to collect the data, obviously, by data collection. Um, best sample sizes, and this comes from uh, Polkinghorne, 1989, I have the footnotes there. Um, the best sample sizes for phenomenological research, 5 and 25 participants. You know, this is, this is give or take. Um, you, my sample size, I don't remember, it was, it was, it was pretty high. It was around, around that. Um, so, 5 and 25, 5 is not bad. 25 is pretty large. Anything larger than 25, you're starting to get into some serious... You can do larger than 25, right? If you have the time and the money to go ahead and interview 100 people, more power to you. You're going to have a huge research project. My particular research interest now as a professor, since this is what I do for a living, is to start looking at populations with an end of, you know, 50 or more. You can do phenomenological research with uh, an end of greater than 25. It's going to cost a lot of money. It's going to take a lot of time. But if you're willing to spend the time, and this might be, you know, a year-long process. Like for me, I'm going to take the next two, three years and just collect data and then spend another year or two analyzing it. But the, the more, uh, the larger your end is, the more viable your research. Uh, not to say that small research isn't viable as well, but, you know, you, you want to make sure you get a good sample size. Talk to your professors. Your professors will tell you what they think your end should be. Uh, it depends on the nature of the research. I've had uh, graduate students, my end, I forget, it was like something like 12, 15 maybe, um, which is a pretty significant number given the age of the population of, of Holocaust survivors. Um, for other types of research, if you're doing something on education, you might have access to, you know, 25, 30 students in one classroom, right? So you might have an end much, much higher than that. Um, so it depends. But uh, the, the bureaucrats say 5 to 25, so we'll go with 5 to 25. All right.